started, I'm going to start by saying I'm super excited. I've got Diva here with you. I hope you've all watched her video. Um, excitingly, she comes from Trinidad and Tobago, and she might be the first person I ever met who came from there, which is cool. Um, but also, she left a really solid impression. Um, um, she laughs a lot, which is awesome. And if you read her guest Q&A, that's one of the things that helps her to get through and do what she does, which I think is such a great thing, just like, you know, having a good sense of humor. So I think we may have gelled on that. Um, and then also, uh, you know, Diva is a deep sea scientist. I'm super excited. Last week, we had Darshan Ajayawadana, the Sri Lankan tech diver. A couple of weeks before that, we had Shailene Potter, who was a polar diver. So we've just got Diva here to like show them all up by going even deeper, <laughs> right? Um, and so I'm really excited to have it here. You guys, I've got a bunch of questions I'm going to ask, but feel free to swap, you know, put some questions down here. I'm going to like, if you see me craning my neck, that's because I'm trying to read, right? It's awkward. But um, um, yeah, so let's get going. <laughs> all right. I'm going to ask you, first of all, I'm super excited that you go down in submersibles. I don't think excited is the word. I think jealous is the word. Um can you just tell us what it's like to be in a submersible and like maybe how big they are and like how long you sit there and what it feels like and just recreate? Firstly, let me say thank you for having me as part of this awesome little series. It's been so wonderful watching all the other videos from all these incredible women from around the globe. And um, yeah, it's just been wonderful. Also, first time I met you, I was just like, you and Ayana were like two of those people that, I was like, you know what? I can be like them maybe one day. Oh, God. Like, ah, you know? So, so when I met you in Boston that time, I was like, oh, wow. Oh, I God. love it. Oh, my God, it's Asha. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm really amazed. I mean, that's not weird way. That's meant to be in a very complimentary way. Plus, then, yeah, you're, you're just awesome as well. Like, apart from all the work that you do, you're just a great person. So... Anyway, let's get on to, don't worry, I'll continue throughout. Um, so, submersibles. I was like, what were we talking about? Um, <laughs> so there, I mean, there tend to be like two sort of main types of them. And I know you'll find this out soon. But the, the first type is like the more touristy type that goes down to only like a thousand meters depth, oh. so like a kilometer. And those tend to be pretty comfortable. Yeah, there are normally two or three seats inside of it. You're sitting upright, you're in this massive, like sort of sphere, like acrylic sphere. And it's a very comfortable, wonderful ride. Like that was not the submersible that I went first went down in. The first one I went down in was like <laughs> the deeper ones. We'll get back to the comfortable ones, but the deeper ones. And those are like a metal sphere and they are way smaller. You cannot stand in them. And there are normally three, three people, including you. And because the, the floor of it is just like this little padded mat and you lie or sit on the floor and just have a little window that's probably like this big. So you can literally just do that against it. And the first submersible I ever went in was a Japanese submersible. And so the two pilots were Japanese I obviously am on a pleb and don't speak any other languages. So I obviously couldn't communicate with them. They couldn't really communicate with me, though they did a much better job than I did. And we were, it's so cramped that you're basically touching both of them. Oh, Instagram's telling me I've passed my daily amount I should be online. <laughs> so you're basically touching both of them and you're, I was in the fetal position, literally, for most of it, right? Like hunched. And How long? So it's exactly. So it depends on the depth, but usually the dive from by the time you get in on the ship and get back out on the ship, it's usually like nine hours. And I mean, that's a long time to stay in a fetal position. Like when you get out of it, you're like uncoiling, like you're coming out of like a chrysalis, like, you know, um, and uh, yeah, it actually hurts a bit. But mm. from, and of course it's like this amazing experience, you know, you're a little bit, on the first one I was a little afraid because you're like, well, what if something happens? But really there's nothing you could do. Um, and, but really my overwhelming faith throughout all of it was I have a bladder that is the size of like a pea. And it just, I was terrified of that needing to wee wee basically. Yeah. Like, yeah, terrified. That's a valid, that's a valid fear. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah. And I was like, you know, bring, de deck, bring it on. Having to <laughs> strip off and pee in front of two male pilots who don't speak English and we really are like touching, we're so close. Not so hot, not so hot. So <laughs> That's a pretty special experience. I mean, I, I mean, okay, so so you're down there and it and is it hot? Is it is it do you eat? I mean, like food so <laughs> important. Like what happens there? So, you can't pee. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right so for instance in the japanese one they give you like a flask of green tea i mean we're sick into stereotypes eh? flask of green tea bento box right so you get in with your little lunch and then you're in there you've got some little musubis and like like other things and um little bits and bobs but i was too terrified to drink anything for the entire time um and i had dehydrated myself for like 12 hours minimum before <laughs> Because again, this is a, this was a very valid fear for me. <laughs> but yeah, you like snick snack as you're doing stuff. But also, you know, you're you're usually the only scientist in the submersible. The other two are pilots, or the other one is a pilot. And of course, you have colleagues back on the ship who have essentially designated you as the person to do all their tasks on that dive. And that means that you have a shopping list of things you have to get through. So from the time you hit the sea floor you're like go 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 and you forget your fear you forget like needing to potentially go to the bathroom you forget all those things because you're just like i have to do these things because my colleagues are expecting me to and and i want to obviously um but in terms of temperature at the top there's not really any like temperature regulation so if you're diving in a tropical place at the top it's a freaking sauna because and you're you are normally dressed enough wow. in the very deep ones to, to withstand cold. Which oh, wow. So like, for instance, my first dive was in the Caribbean and I was wearing thermals and I was just like sweltering, okay. sweltering. And on top of it, when you're being launched off the ship and like waiting, if it's a little rough, you're just like in a little washing machine, hot. It's not, it's not nice, but... Mm. <laughs> But then when you get down a depth, of course, it's like the deep sea is really cold, right? Like temperatures hover just above freezing and the temperature plummets. And it plummets so much that all inside of the sphere gets condensation from your bodies. And so it's like constantly like raining on you, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not selling this at all, but <laughs> it's like raining on you and you have to take a towel and like, you know, wipe it up and stuff. But um, but I will say that despite all of, despite the seasickness, despite the fear of having to flee, despite the raining of everyone's perspiration and breath basically onto you, it is incredible. You, you're you incredibly lucky to be able to have that experience because currently there are only, you know, a handful of submersibles in the world. Um, that's obviously gonna change as time goes on. But right now it's still a massive privilege and as I say to most people, it's like, as a deep sea scientist, we know so little about the planet and the deep ocean that every time you go down there, you see something new. And that is just blow mind. And being able to see it with your own eyes as well, like you, when you're using a remotely operated vehicle, which is the unmanned one, so they're like the robots we send down, you can't really get like perspective. Like you can't tell how steep something is. It's like watching your TV and it's just very difficult to pick that up. Um, whereas when you're down there, you suddenly get a very real feel for how it actually is, like what the terrain is really like. And that's mm -hmm. yeah. so, so, when, so on these dives, right? Like, um, I love that you acknowledge your privilege in this situation, like the privilege to do it. Because yeah. like, there's few submersibles and there's very, very few people who ever got to go down and you've been down many, many times. Yep. Um, is there any like particular species that either like, you was like I mean I'm sure you're excited to see everything because there's probably like a giant percentage of what you're seeing is new every time because these mm -hmm. are such unexplored places and that's what I want people to realize it's just like it's like the ocean is so undiscovered right and um but like was there like one particular moment that you can recall where you saw something flash past and you were just mind blown beyond every other time that you might be mind blown <laughs> <laughs> that's possible my, okay, ooh, I mean, there's, I think there's, a, there's 
there's like lots of standout moments and I'll and cheesily I'll say that you have one of those normally like every single expedition um but expedition terrible word research cruise um but the when I think like I cry really easily <laughs> yes well it's funny. I, people are like that girl must have some emotional baggage because she's crying every 24 seconds like you know <laughs> So, so I think one of the most standout moments for me was my first research cruise and it was in the Caribbean, which was incredible. And I don't think I truly understood how privileged that experience was given how little of the Caribbean deep sea has been explored. Um, but I had been invited on before I did my, I just applied for PhD programs and it was purely just like a, and this is often the way it goes, right? Like a, a tutor at university knew I was from Trinidad. The ship was docking in Trinidad and just felt like was wonderful enough to extend a berth to me on the ship. And I didn't have any affiliation to the program, like nothing. It was just a very like, you know, serendipitous almost like a, a helping up from a mentor, I guess. Right. And, um, and so we we're on that expedition cruise research cruise. Sorry. He's still saying that. And, we went down into, well, we weren't actually going down. We were sending a robot down to look for the world's deepest hydrothermal vents, which are these like underwater volcano type things that gush the superheated chemical rich fluid. And they're just these really unique deep sea ecosystems. And they had never been found in the Caribbean Ocean, Caribbean Ocean, Caribbean Sea. What is wrong with me today? Caribbean Sea. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, yeah, it was it was a really special moment. And when the first ones zoomed into the view, right? Like you're you're following breadcrumbs and you're like, okay, there's some more animals here. Ooh, the yeah. seafloor is getting more more metal, like iron rich. Like, you know, you're following the little clues up to where it is. And when those chimneys came into view, they were like ten meters tall, like just drain wow. pipe thin gushing like I think the temperature was nearly 400 degrees Celsius Ooh. water and yeah I like wept like a like a child I, I just was I think yeah it was my first cruise PhD student no one <laughs> knew me apart from like two people and they were like who is this crazy lady who's just standing here weeping um and yeah that that was kind of the moment that solidified it to me that I wanted to go down this path of deep sea deep sea science but yeah yeah that's amazing i mean i i mean okay so i like watch movies and i cry <laughs> all the time and it's you what? on planes <laughs> i wa on planes i'll watch like a rom-com and then i'm like sniffling and like trying not to let other people see it's really embarrassing yes. but it's a thing apparently it's a phenomenon it's so on planes. nobody else worried no it's a thing on planes especially like your emotions are heightened and yeah exactly it could be like the funniest movie and i'm just like oh <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. But okay. So something that probably did make you cry recently um, or not recently through your recent work and you just had a publication out, right? So congratulations on that. Um, and you know where I'm going with this now. Um, you discovered a new species in places that you didn't expect to find it. Plastic, right? Yay. Um, can you, I know. Can you tell me, can you just tell us a little bit about that? Like the project and sort of like what you guys found? Because I want people to also realize that not only is it like incredible that, you know, there's a small handful of people that go to these spaces, but doesn't mean that we aren't touching these places, regardless of the fact that we're not actually physically going there. Right. Um, so I'd love for exactly. you to talk a little bit about that paper. Yeah. So exactly as you say, I mean, I think I've been on like nearly 20 research cruises now and on nearly every single one, we've seen some evidence of us, of mm -hmm. us, even though there are places that before that point, no one had ever been there. So, I mean, I'm talking from the Mariana Trench to the smack bang middle of the Atlantic to the Southern Ocean, like our trash is always there. Mm -hmm. And so I was on, I was leading a research um, cruise to the Marianas region. So in the very West Pacific, just well it's where the Mariana Trench is but there's a series of islands called Guam and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands and um, it was a research cruise for NOAA 
where they actually stream everything live on the Okeanos Explorer. So it was a really fun cruise um, so that anyone can watch. But during that cruise on our third dive, we, it was our deepest dive of the cruise. We were operating at nearly six kilometers and we were just finding like spam cans, plastic bags. It looked like a pair of jeans, like just down there. I mean, basically it, the thing is, it's not like a plastic bag all, all the time. It's often just household items that we use. Glass bottles, there was a Hershey's cocoa tin, you know, and on that dive, I think we saw like five or six pieces of trash in that, just in that little stretch of time. And again, before that moment, no one has been there. No one has seen the seafloor there. So it, on that dive, it kind of hit home. I was like, man, we're seeing a lot of trash. What's going on here? And it turned out over this three year period, Noah, ha Noah had started this project called the Capstone Project, which was looking at all the Pacific Ocean um, US monuments, so protected areas, as well as some other areas. And this was like a three year program, it was a massive deal, um, 188 ROV dives, which is a lot. Wow. Um, and so they just had this, all this data, which is publicly available for anybody to use. But because mm. I guess I had had experience in one of the cruises, I was like, hey, why don't we, why don't we explore this? And so we were able to look at the entire data set, go through all of the video. And yeah, man, it was sad. It took, basically, we, I mean, we only found trash, I think, on 17.5% of the dives, um, which doesn't sound only. like that much. But exactly. Exactly. Mm. You're like, oh, that's not even a fifth. But then you're like, wait, hang on. These are literally some of the most remote parts of our planet in the middle of the Pacific, far away from in inhabited land, most of them. Right. And it was, as I was saying, it was like metal stuff. So because of the huge historical, the huge history in that region, right, um, there were loads of like unexploded bombs like oh, wow. ammunition of various types, like bits. They were not, there was an old dock, we think from World War II that had just been intentionally sunk. Wow. Um, there were just all kinds of things of metal bits. Then there were, there was like a Japanese ceramic cup. There was loads of plastic. There was loads of fishing gear. There was, but it, what was so striking about it was that it was loads and loads of household items, mm -hmm. things that we use all the time. And I think we forget that, you know, when we put our stuff in the trash, in our kitchens or wherever, it's going to go to the dump and way, then it will just disappear magically, right? And it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And we, some of, one of the correlations we found in the paper was that we found more trash, obviously, closer to populated areas. So the, but the hot spots were off of American Samoa and off of Hawaii. And, mm -hmm. um, and, that's, and it's linked to us, right? We're the ones, essentially, it's flowing out of our rivers and we're dumping it overboard by accident, potentially, you just never know. Um, but it was, it was really striking because when we did the estimates, it was like for some of these places like American Samoa, the estimates were coming up to like a thousand pieces of trash in one square kilometer, given the rates we had seen them at. So wow. just, I mean, think about like, think Ooh. about that, right? Like a thousand pieces of trash in the deep sea in one square kilometer. It's insane. So, and the insane. other sad bit about, the other sad bit about the study was that, um, well, it wasn't, it was weird, right? So we were obviously looking at pieces of trash that we could see in the video that we had collected. So that means mm -hmm. they have to be bigger than like two centimeters. Okay. And, uh, a lot of the trash actually wasn't having a negative impact as far as we could see on animals. Mm -hmm. So some was like there were fish, there was fishing gear entangled in corals, for instance, and we know that's negative. And deep sea corals can live for thousands and thousands of years, right? Like mm -hmm. the oldest one that's ever been aged is like 4,200 years old. So Ooh, think about wow. that. one animal yeah. alive, 4,200 years old, right? So having a, having a piece of our fishing line from like 10 years ago, wrap up in it and kill it. Come on. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, it, 
we actually found that a lot of the animals were using the trash to their advantage. So like one of the most striking photos was an anemone on a bucket and it had attached to the anemone and was using it to get up into the water column to feed on bits going by. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so uh, some of them were attaching to it and some animals were also sheltering in it. But okay. I mean, while that might sound okay, like we're like, I mean, well, we shouldn't be putting trash into the ocean, obviously. Right? No. And, but the scary thing is, is that of course trash breaks down, right? In the deep sea, things happen more slowly, things last mm -hmm. longer, but ultimately they do break down. And they sometimes break down before they get into the deep sea, of course. Mm -hmm. So we all know about microplastics and chemicals. And so while these are the impacts we can see, who knows what we can't see are likely mm. low, like we know there are loads of microplastics in the deep sea and loads of chemicals found in the organisms from the Mariana Trench and other really remote places. So just because we can't see the impacts doesn't mean they're not there, but it yeah. was, it was sad, man. Yeah, it's sad. And I mean, that's why I was saying, you know, here's something that will make you cry. And it is really the work you do. And I mean, it's, it is crazy to think that six kilometers below the surface that you're finding plastics, which means you and I, like you go there, but I've, you know, I've been there in terms of the fact that I am a contributor to this trash that goes out there and yeah. everybody who's watching and everyone who ever, you know, on this planet is basically has been to the bottom of the ocean by virtue of these things that we consume and just throw away without thinking and just because you know it's out of sight out of mind and that's the sad part right we don't really think consciously of the fact that just because we don't physically see it doesn't mean it's gone away right yeah. but um but what's the deepest dive you've done that's kind of a sort of a thing that i'm kind of intrigued by uh not not that deep actually when you think you about said it six uh, kilometers. like 2.6 no 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 that was so that was with an rov um, which oh, okay. means I'm sitting very comfortably on the ship, you know, having tea and doing other things, using the bathroom as I would please. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the deepest one I've done is two and a half, two point six kilometers, which was in the Caribbean, which was nice because um, it was that's, like right that's, in the back. Yeah. I mean, that's not deep, but that's deeper than most of us have ever got on. So just that's deeper than eye. like they can come and help me if anything was wrong. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> But what, so what, so like, you know, you come from Trinidad and Tobago, like, you know, what's it like and how did you get inspired to go in, like, into this area? I know, you know, obviously there's water around, right? So, but what is it that made you want to be a deep sea biologist? You went off in that submersible, right? Sure. There, we go. there was something, there must have been something that triggered it before that. You're back. Yeah. So, um, so. I mean, and I'd love to, I'd love to hear like your version of this in terms of why you decided to, to work with whales, right? Um, so please tell me after, but the, so of course, right? Like you, it's, you grew up on an island, you're surrounded by water, like 30 something years ago, there wasn't that much to do in terms of like cinema and stuff. <laughs> so you went and you entered yourself outside. I grew up outside by the water on the beach. It was just the way things work, right? Um, but like we were a very sort of oceany family. We were just always by the sea. And obviously there's that lev that that inspiration is very important. And a lot of my earliest memories, as cheesy as it is, us are, are from the ocean. Like I distinctly remember before it was before my sister was born, so like maybe I must have been younger than four. I remember seeing a dead manta ray on a beach. Okay. And it was like, I'm not sure what had happened to it, but it was dead. And, and then I, and then I remember seeing like starfish when we went on, when we went to the beach and my dad like brought it for me or, um, and then I often, I don't know, they're just, it's weird. It's like really early memories tied to the ocean, but, um, man, like the deep sea, bio deep sea biology just wasn't a thing. Right. And in the Caribbean, at least in the time that I was growing up, it was like, you, ca you became a doctor, you ca became a lawyer, or you became an engineer. Right? <laughs> and <laughs> I know you can empathize with that. <laughs> totally, and totally. So I was like, cool, doctor, bring it. And <laughs> because I mean, it, it, I think 
a lot of the work that we do, even though it stems around the ocean, is obviously linked intrinsically to people, right? And I guess that was one way of trying to get to, get to that. But um, my mom was like, you know, and I mean, props to her for doing this, but she was like, you know, I don't think you'd be happy doing medicine. Why don't you do something you truly love? And at that point, I was like, okay, interesting. Um, but I decided, yeah, I loved marine science and decided to do that. But as I was saying, like growing up deep sea wasn't a thing. All I knew was like mm -hmm. coral reefs, mangroves, mm -hmm. seagrass. Um, and you just knew it, there was out there, but you just didn't mm -hmm. really think about it. And, and I remember like going to sea when I was little and being like, I wish I, wish I had a device that I could sit up on the boat and I could see what was down there and see all the animals down there. It was always about the animals. Like, I wish I could just see all the animals down there. And, and you know, that's basically what an ROV is, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and it wasn't until I went to university that I realized, you know, deep sea science was an option. It was a career option. And I mean, you'll never be rich, but... <laughs> But it's it's the most fulfilling thing well, I yeah exactly rich right it makes you rich in right? other ways yeah. exactly and it it in my first deep sea science class which was my last year of my degree uh, the lecturer the professor was was saying that like less than one percent of it has ever been explored and we now know that actually that's way off the mark it's more like point zero 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 one percent has ever been seen or imaged. Um, and it just blows my mind. This is our own planet. Mm. And we're able to do the most incredible things, put people on the moon, put people at the ice, uh, like you're know, living in space, but yet we are struggling to even comprehend what is in our, what is in our oceans. But I think, I don't know how it was for you, but it was obviously a lot of hard work, but obviously a lot of luck as well. Um, and a lot of support from others as well helped me to get where, where I am. And, and that's not really something that should be underestimated, that all of those three things coming together, um, because it's not just luck, it's also privilege. So hard work, luck, privilege, and, and then having support, a supportive group of people who will um, elevate you and push you. Um, but yeah, it, it's been amazing and and I often say there are very few careers that really allow you to see things that no one has seen before and this is one of them yeah please tell me about you I, and whales okay I'll tell you later because I mean I don't think anyone here wants to listen to my story right now but I want to I, I to say like when it when it comes to luck um so my what I say about luck is luck is what you create by the decisions you make um and Like they'll look at you and be like, oh, you were just lucky, so I don't even need to try. But the point is, your luck stems from the fact that you made decisions that took you in this direction. It's exactly what I did. I made decisions that weren't easy, right? I could have gone in the doctor, lawyer, engineer path, but I was like, I really want, this is what I want to do. I had to create a whole field in Sri Lanka that never existed before, right? And the challenges, like nobody will necessarily know all the challenges that we've been through, but the point being that there have been them, but it's also made the journey more interesting. So that's something that I want people to think about too. Uh, having support, obviously, is a great thing, but you can find support in different people. And so we had the yep. same kind of support in terms of parents, but, you know, there are people around us who will support us. Um, yep. and, and we just have to learn to filter out the people who don't support us. And I know that's easier said than done, but it's something that I think the more we can learn to just be like, and also trust yourself, right? Like there's a lot of self-trust um, yep. that goes into it to believe that I can do it. And lots of people will turn around and be like, oh, like, you know, that's not the path to go down. And you're like, in your head, you have to be like, it's fine. Like, let them say what they want to say, but I'm going to take this one foot in front of the other and see where I go, right? Um, so I just wanted to add that to what you had to say. But I, I saw a couple of questions coming in and you answered one because someone wanted to know like how much of the deep sea have you explored? So you sort of touch on that. Um, there was a question about what's your favorite trench? <laughs> I've only been to one uh, and that's the Mariana Trench, but I haven't been to the deepest point. Um, but... Okay. Favorite trench? Ooh, I mean, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be biased. I know I fly. I've been to two, 
So my favorite one is probably the Cayman Trench and that's off the Cayman Islands. And it's obviously my favorite because it's in the Caribbean and that's where I'm from. Yeah, I like that. Good right. answer. That's a good no answer. bias there whatsoever. Um, okay, so I've, I've, got, I've got a few more questions and I know, uh, I'm just mindful of the time. It has been about 30 minutes, but I think we can squeeze in a couple more. Um, I Which do is want... crazy because I could just keep doing this. Like, I no. know, <laughs> totally. I'm totally into this. <laughs> That's the problem. The two of us together is probably dangerous. But um, I do have a couple of <laughs> questions. One is, one, I want people, um, actually there's a two or three quick questions. One is, um, you know, there's this whole deep sea mining and I'd like to talk just briefly about what it is and, you know, really like talking about the impacts to the deep oceans and sort of like what we as humans, are, now we know that there's plastics out there that, you know, have gone out there despite not us not being there, but there are other yep. things and there are impending sort of threats that we can think about. Um, deep sea mining is something that I don't think people have clarity on and it would be cool if you can just talk a little bit because I know you're at the forefront of sort of sort of helping to set the regulations, which I think mm -hmm. is amazing, by the way. And mm -hmm. I'd love for people to learn a little bit more about it and what it is and why it exists and why in some ways it might be important as well. Yeah, so deep sea mining is a really interesting issue. Um, so of course, it's just one of the impacts facing the deep ocean. As you said, there's of course pollution, um, but also there's climate change is happening. It's happening in, we see it in our shallows, but it's also very prevalent in the depths. And then there's also fishing. Fishing has probably wreaked the most havoc in the deep sea so far. Um, but this, this you know, growing industry of deep sea mining is coming. Basically, we're, we're running out of easily accessible minerals, so metals on land and in shallow waters. And so now, a lot of folks are thinking that the best place to get that may be in the deep ocean. Um, in the deep sea, there tend to be, I'm doing this really quickly, there tend to be three sort of main environments where the metals are found. One of them are is hydrothermal vents. Um, so there's like beautiful chimneys with lots and lots of unique life around them. Um, then polymetallic nodules, which are these sort of potato sized lumps of metal that sit on the seafloor like cobbles. And then seamounts. So on seamounts, in our there are mountains in the ocean, and a lot of them are covered in this thick cobalt crust, cobalt-rich crust. And a lot of these have like nickel, cobalt, copper, like loads and loads of metals that we need for things like just developing our economies, right? Like industrialization and uh, really scarily also green technology. Batteries use a lot of these metals. So one of the biggest arguments is that if we want to transition to a green economy using renewable energy, fighting climate change, we need to deep sea mine. And I'm not convinced by that. But anyway, so these three environments where deep sea mining might happen, are uh, what I want you to, to remember, not you, but everyone listening to remember, is that most of them have never been seen, visited, studied, understood. And that's scary because obviously deep sea mining is gonna remove large portions of the sea floor and the places that have been, okay, let's go back a second. So already in international waters, there have been 30 licenses granted for exploration as a precursor to mining. So currently there's been no mining because there aren't rules for mining yet, but it's, it's coming and the rules are being put into place. Um, so right now, those 30 licenses, each of them, like in some places in an area of the Pacific called the Clarion Clifton Zone, there are some licenses there that are the size of Sri Lanka, right? So like 70,000 square kilometers, roughly. Like m these are massive areas of the sea floor. And if mining happens there, it's gonna remove parts of the sea floor. Many of the animals rely on that to attach to and the, the scariest part is that we don't know all the animals. Mm. We don't know what's there. We don't know how they live. We don't know what the impacts will be on them. Um, though we can guess they'll be bad. Most of them will be killed. And, and not just that, but we need to remember that our oceans are connected, right? It's not just the sea floor and then the water is different, but everything is connected. And there will be, in the mining process, there will likely be very big plumes. So these sort of dust clouds almost created. And 
those could spread quite far. We think in some, in some cases, maybe five times the size of the area actually mined. Ooh. So this is like massive tracts of the ocean that will probably be impacted. And um, yeah, that, that could have, we don't, we don't know, that's the thing, we just don't know whether it will impact things like our fisheries, things like the ocean's ability to store carbon. Um, mm. These really big processes that the deep ocean plays a really important role in, we don't know how that will be impacted. And, and we know that biodiversity is important for so many reasons and, and whether losing biodiversity is acceptable or mm. um, might actually you know, stymie some really great uses of, of things in the deep sea. Like we've heard that one of the one of the diagnostic tests for coronavirus, COVID-19, used an enzyme that was found, that was isolated, blah, 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 from an animal at hydrothermal vents, from mm -hmm. a microbe, sorry, at hydrothermal vents. And so the, we could find things like new antibiotics in the deep ocean, lots of really useful compounds. And so to mm -hmm. just kill that biodiversity now, or at least harm it, is just not, in my mind, not a, a valid uh, reason and and there's all these other political issues tied up around it like given that it's the international area you have to share the proceeds mm -hmm. how do yeah. you share the proceeds with everyone in the world and the fact that most of the mining companies come from developed countries and yeah. the developing countries are being left out the loop or if they're in the loop they're in a relationship with the vet, with the mining companies that is pretty exploitative right like oil and gas companies from once upon Absolutely. a time so there's just all these issues of equity, but also just, do we want to go into the last unexplored frontier on the planet and ruin it? I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me. Yay. Yeah, I know, <laughs> going down there and like, before we can even figure out what's out there to destroy it, it seems really, I mean, I'm obviously with you, you know, and I, I think there's lots of people here who are with us on this. Um, but I think we, not, like most people don't even understand, like, you know, our phones have, you know, so we're exactly. all part of the problem because our phones have components that are, you know, minerals that come that, you know, where those, where are they coming from? Right. So we have to think, you know, we also have to be more conscious and that's sort of another reason why, like, you know, um, yep. having people like you here is important because I think these are stories that a lot of people don't get to hear. These are things that, and also not from the source, right? You can get a lot of information on the internet these days, right? And we all know that, but not all of it is necessarily vetted. And uh, which is why having people like you who are like right at the forefront, really working hard to make sure that these processes that in some ways are inevitable are being done in the best way. And at least they're not happening without a fight, right? Like that's the important thing. And, exactly. and I want you know people to realize that we ha all have kind of a role in everything we can't just sit back and be like well diva's doing the work and that's cool because you know what like diva wouldn't have to do the work if i didn't have a phone with me right now that needed these minerals <laughs> or like that's you know that green that like that electric car that i have that needs a battery that needs the minerals like you know like that's what it is i know you want to say something it's, it's so funny you raised the phone thing because like when you were like my phone is too old to like and it'll shut down i was like i love you even more because it means you haven't updated your phone in like forever and that's great <laughs> but yeah as you say like phones have like 60 different types of metals in them six zero okay wow and that's just your phone and we all trade out our phones every couple of years we all get a new computer every couple of years we're all part of the problem and and really i mean yes a lot of needs to be top down like policy decisions but ultimately, we, the population, have an impact on those policy decisions. So we need to start raising our voices and we need to start thinking about our actions and not consuming as much as we currently do. Absolutely. I think that's so, so right. And what you said also about, like, why, I mean, you know, you basically covered all my questions. It's like, why should people care about the deep sea? I think that's pretty obvious. Um, if nothing else, right, like the medical cures that we get from it, right, like you say, the basically uh, one of the potential cures for corona is from a bacteria on a hydrothermal vent um and the not cure not cure know. it's one of the tests they use one oh, of the one tests, of the tests. Use that, to yeah. sorry, yeah. sorry yeah. my mistake but like you know and hydrothermal vents 
everybody is like they're basically like the deeper you go in the ocean there's less and less sunlight right you can imagine it doesn't penetrate so far and like diva's talking about super deep places as we know she doesn't hang out in the shallows i mean that's like overrated but she likes it to be dark <laughs> she just wants to use her own flashlight to see things but um <laughs> but these hydrothermal vents are places where life can exist but rather than using photosynthesis which is like everything's like driven by sunlight and kind of like you know you know just what happens with our plants and stuff they photosynthesize into these um oxygen into the environment and stuff in hydrothermal vents they use chemosynthetic processes so like all chemically driven right but you know these are these are not you know when you go down there and now i never have but i'm talking but based you on will, you will you <laughs> will yes yes i will uh wish hard enough right um uh, but uh, um these are and and you know like Diva talks about them and you may imagine like these hydrothermal vents are like all over but they're not they're like they're like islands in the middle of deserts right like that's what is that what the deep oceans like yeah so for hydrothermal vents actually crazy statistic if you took all the hydrothermal vents in the world right like in the world's oceans and you added up the area that they occupy it would be 50 kilometers so that's like my phone is like you got my battery is going to die but the the 50 km squared is like the size of bermuda the island okay which is teeny teeny tiny and this is all hydrothermal vents in the world so these are a super crazy. unique like ecosystem that is so rare but also is just brimming with life and brimming with unique and new life and brimming with life that could be really useful to us you know in one way shape or form yeah yeah so that i mean that's that's the other thing i want people to realize is the deep sea is basically a desert right like when you go down there and it's not like when you go down to the bottom there's like life everywhere right it's like you have to wait there's a whole lot of patience involved right and um well, maybe like unless you piss the jackpot i mean part. i think it's i think it's like deep the deep sea is like land is like on land like it's really similar right um and there's a load of different types of habitat see on land you get like plains you get mountains you get canyons whatever right but it's the same thing in the deep sea and each of those habitats has its own sort of set of life that goes with it and so yes it may not be things that when you're in a submersible and you're looking out you may not see that much superficially but that's because a lot of things are really tiny and mm. a lot of them live in the in the sediment and then the sea floor so it doesn't mean they're not there and it doesn't mean they're not yeah. important but it's just not in some places not as obvious as in others yeah. but then i mean just like on land that like there are just these most amazing rainforests of coral and there there are just hot spots of life and these are more common than people would think definitely mm -hmm. um so i wouldn't i would never say it's a desert uh but definitely it just it's it's different to yeah. it, to on land but also similar to how it's on yeah. land and that's so yeah so i guess um like i guess i what i was maybe trying to say and i probably worded it wrong was it's not like you know when people see coral reefs on documentaries like these just like wild shows of fit, schools of fish and stuff it's it's not, i mean it is hard work to get out there and to like you know look for things and find those hydrothermal vents i mean they're clearly few and far between and when we think yeah. about these ecosystems they're so unique just like you say there are specific species that will be associated with them and if there's only specific species that can associate with a hydrothermal vent um and if they're like so far apart like if you remove that hydrothermal vent then where do those species go like they it's not easy for them to necessarily go to the next like just migrate to the next one right and that's that's problematic um exactly yeah. yep exactly yeah but um you're on it okay i mean gonna, yeah totally <laughs> look at me but okay <laughs> so i'm going to ask uh, one more question um uh because i this is actually a question from navika who's a huge ocean swell ocean hero and i and his question was um do you have you ever seen long arm squid no so like i love cephalopods 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 how do you want to pronounce them squid and octopus right. and cuttlefish um but actually like in the deep sea you just don't see squid that often and i think it's because of the technology we use so when you go down there with an rov or a submersible they have crap tons of light they're really noisy 
there's all these electromagnetic things going on. And actually it means that a lot of animals that are mobile, like squid, peace out, right? Uh -huh. So we don't see things like that uh, as often as we would like. But we tend to get way more octopus. But again, they're still pretty rare because a lot of them just are out once they hear, see us coming. Um, but yeah, Dumbo octopus, see a lot of them. Um, but no, a lot of the, a lot of the, like, squids, because I know they're the best. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, oh. but yeah, no, um, just not, not, not a lot of squid, actually, surprisingly. Mm. Okay. Well. I'm definitely never the giant squid or colossal squid. That would be amazing. Oh, God, please. If you ever see any of them, I mean, <laughs> hello. Right? Like, oh, God, I would probably just die for you. And we exactly. on land just, for you. Just die That's at what that I'm moment. Doing. You'd be like, I'm done. Yeah. I'm done here. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> My life complete. All right. Well, that was really great. I could ask questions forever. Um, yes, I who doesn't love Dumbo octopus? What's that? I can just continue chatting with you forever. <laughs> no, it's been so amazing. You know, I've really enjoyed it. And um, it's been really great. And, you know, the whole intention of the Tiny Desk Adventure really is to get people excited about the oceans, but also to realize that marine conservation, marine science, the oceans are just so diverse, right? I want people to realize that it's not just about the whales. It's not just about the plankton. It's not just about... Um, you know, the whale sharks or the sharks. It's just different ecosystems. It's not just only species, it's ecosystems, but then you also can be, can also be related to people, right? So there's so many aspects of this field that, um, and also, you know, I feel, I feel privileged to have amazing networks of humans um, and uh, who I can tap into like you guys um, to bring these stories to parts of the world that don't get to hear it. And I know, you know, my work, your work, it's, you know, our work is known in lots of parts of the world, but the parts that matter most to us sometimes don't get exposed to the work that we do, right? And I know you and I have this shared passion for like, yeah. kind of like making sure that the local heroes get to rise and yeah. that coastlines have people and we are capacity building on the ground so we can solve our own problems. We can also like do our own explorations, yeah. right? And so, um, so, so, you know, that's kind of soul sister sort of situation. And it's, you know, um, I think that's really important. And I want people to see us and realize that we're human. We're ridiculous. We cry on the <laughs> Um, You know, that's important, like humanizing these people. Because otherwise, you know, what happens is like a, a kid might see a photograph and it's static. And then they're like, and it just says Dr. Diva Amen. And then they're just like, I'll never be that person. But I want this to be a space where they can see us and be like, I am that person. I watch dumb movies and cry as well, right? And that's, <laughs> that's like kind of the thing. It's, um, it's, it's so important, I think, you know, for people. I just so checking to see if I've missed anything. No, I was about to say, I, I, I so, lost you for the last like 10, 15 seconds, but don't worry. I was I was just saying nice things about you, so it's cool. Yeah. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, but I I want to say to everyone out there, you know, just follow Dr. Diva Amon. Her handle is diva underscore Amon on Instagram. Um, follow her work. She's doing really important work in many ways. Um, not just like me, you know, fighting for more people in the developing world to be able to get into these spaces, but also she's really at the forefront of um, the conversation about deep sea mining and how it should happen if it should happen. And I think that's incredible to see someone who looks like us being out there and being that voice and being so involved. Uh, there's a whole lot of, you, uh, you know, Ocean's Day events coming up starting tomorrow. Oh, uh, like, that both of us are participating. Yeah. Uh, yes, that I know. I'm also like, like, oh, like last week. Really? It just seems to be never ending. <laughs> so, yeah. UN World Ocean's Day. There's the United Nations um, uh, UNEP Youth Conference. There's the... World Economic Forum, Virtual Dives. I'm just throwing this at you because I want you guys to uh, join in and listen to some of the conversations. We put, we make sure that we put all the information out because we want you all to be able to have the opportunity to engage. Um, and also, apart from that, Diva does these really cool, throughout the whole COVID-19 lockdown, she was doing these really amazing little pieces on her Instagram about the deep sea. So if you missed that, go back and you can spend your afternoon reading them. And now it's like, what is it? Twice.
Oh, I, oh yes. I, 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 did you ask how many I'm about you now? Yeah. How, no, how many yeah, do I'm you back. do now? How often? So now it's twice a week. I haven't done it this week because I find this week people have been a bit, there's obviously so much else going on that is so much more important. Um, but from next week, it should be back every Tuesday and Thursday, deep sea facts. But, um, okay. but also there are loads of other amazing deep sea biologists on, on Instagram as well. And yeah, I can help tag them and stuff and other ones. But it's, this yeah. has been wonderful, Asha. Thank you. No, thank you. And uh, we hope you guys will stay tuned to our other Tiny Desk Adventures. Like I said, we have Sheena, who's from the Seychelles, who has her own story to share with all of you. And uh, Diva and I are very excited about her. Um, so, um, you know, that's great seeing up and coming young scientists from this region uh, just breaking through and doing incredible stuff. And that's what makes us happy. And so all of you are people we want to inspire to do great things in your own lives. Um, but also be conscious about the ocean and remember that we we have a we have an impact even if we've not been there and i think that's really the takeaway from what we've um heard from today's talk so yeah. thank you so much diva thank you to everyone who joined us and uh stay tuned and keep following us wednesdays we drop our videos and we have our live chats and we have amazing people like diva thank you thank you so much for having me and thanks for doing this amazing series and thank you everybody for tuning in thank you bye 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 guys <laughs>